So uh, we're going to go into section 12. So the second section of mod two kind of works out where it's like one, two, right? But it won't always be that way. Um, and so last time we talked about, you know, probability a little bit. We talked about like at least the mathematical notation of probability. Um, we talked about a little bit combinatorics. Um, hopefully you guys have started checking out section 11, like going to those labs and stuff like that. I think that's where you're gonna get the most practice of trying it out. Um, again, of course, if you get stuck, you know, reach out. Um, so today there's, I will tell you, this section is a pretty like deep section. Like it's, it's, um, it's a lot of information. I don't know, give me a thumbs up if anyone's like actually started section 12 or like maybe in the middle of it and stuff like that. Yeah, if you go through it, those of you guys are kind of giving thumbs up right now, you'll see there's a lot of information going through. So I'm not gonna cover all of it, like, and you really should go through the curriculum, but I wanna make sure I kind of talk about some stuff and maybe talk about it in a slightly different way. And maybe that gives you a little more context of what's going on and everything like that. Um, hopefully you guys find that useful. So uh, without any more hesitation, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, this also, as always, is in the repo that you guys should know how to find. If you guys don't know what I'm talking about, please let me know. Okay, sorry. And then gotta move the window of you guys so I can see everyone. All right, cool. So um, we're gonna just start off with basically a bunch of statistical um, distributions intro, like what this is. So uh, one thing I'm just importing some of these packages, some of these you already know, like Pandas, Seaborn, NumPy, right? Those kind of things, Matplotlib. Uh, SciPy, um, this is maybe something that we kind of touched a little bit in the mod one, but might've been like a really quick, like, oh, there's an import. Um, SciPy has a lot of statistical package or numerical package, um, I shouldn't say factors, but methods and stuff like those are built in, especially statistics. Um, I will tell you, um, is anyone here by chance familiar with R, like the programming language R? Okay, I see some hands are cool. So if you have been using R in the past, um, I will tell you is R is definitely more superior in statistical packages than like Python. It's just more mature because it was really meant for a lot of stat uh, statisticians. Um, but SciPy has a lot of very similar stuff. Uh, we will talk about um, later in the curriculum like during this module, um, oh my gosh, why can't I think of it? Um, another package, I can't remember, it's stats models? Oh, I don't, why does that seem wrong? Anyway, we're gonna do another package that has a lot of similarity with SciPy statistical packages or methods. Um, and so we'll kind of switch back and forth in there. And that's just showing you two different ways. Um, the other package, which I forget off the top of my head right now, is much closer to um, R. So just kind of know if when you see that in the curriculum. So let's go check this stuff out. So one thing I want to talk about is random stuff. So uh, we kind of talked about a little bit about randomness, um, but computers cannot actually be random, um, which is really harmful when you're trying to do statistics, probability, and stuff like that, which you want to simulate random. But we have something called pseudo-randomness. And so pseudo-randomness really is basically a way for us to do random numbers with a computer. Um, it actually turns out it's deterministic. So you'll see us be able to like basically reproduce the same random numbers, but in all intents and purposes, it's random in the sense that we can say they're not related to each other. Um, the way these are kind of generated are really interesting, but I won't go into it. Um, there's different ways to generate these random numbers. Um, they're not as, usually as, um, they're a little more complex than usually these kind of functions, but you get the point. All right, so NumPy, like I have right here, uh, we actually can use random numbers from NumPy, but we have to do something called a seed. And so the seed right here basically is a thing that um, allows us to say, all right, we're going to deterministically say these are the random numbers. So if you see here, if I do the seed right here, and I do these numbers, and if you actually literally copy this code, you would get the same number of ran uh, random numbers. So this one, I'm going to get random numbers, ran int. This goes from one to 10. I'm going to get five of them. So you can see here, I get eight, six, two, nine, eight. Right, and then the next random numbers, you can see nine, three, eight, eight, eight. So you're like, okay, that looks pretty cool. Now, um, if I put a different seed in here, I would actually get different numbers. So just to kind of prove this, I'm gonna kernel uh, restart. So this should restart everything. So now if I import this guy, I'm actually gonna import this first so I don't forget it. Import this and I'm gonna put, uh, someone give me a random number, any number at all. I see two, all right, now that's two. So two, all right, it could be really any integer. So I run this guy right here. And now if I run this random, look, it's the same function here, I'll get new random numbers. So you can see that's gonna be different. And then you can see this is gonna be different from that one. So, okay, cool, right? So what's really cool though, is if I change this back to four and I'm just gonna do make sure to do a kernel restart to make sure everything gets 
put over. So we remember that originally I had four here and I got eight, 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 six, two, nine, eight, and then this nine, three, eight, 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 right? If I run this now, and I'm just gonna overwrite what was here, you'll see I get the same random numbers. So the reason why we do this, um, you'll see putting a C is so we can be consistent. So we can be consistently random, which sounds kind of weird, but basically it means that we can make sure that we are picking the same random numbers over and over. So we're not like accidentally like seeing something that doesn't actually exist um, just by choosing a different set of random numbers. Okay, so I thought I'd just take a little second to mention about this because usually people will see this, this dot seed for random and be like, what is that thing going on in the curriculum? And that's essentially what we're doing. Okay. Sound good? Any questions or anything? Yeah. All right, cool. So now we're gonna get the real meat, the so distribution. So we can actually make distributions on here. So uh, NumPy actually has with the random package or random uh, class, you can do normal. And so this mu right here, mu usually stands for, um, like you guys know the Greek letter mu is, looks like this, oops, that's not it. I know how to do, hold on, <laughs> sorry. I thought I could just do that on my keyboard, but I'm not. So there we go. It looks like a U, like with a little side of there. Um, so this is called mu right here. So you'll see this typically. And that usually means the mean, right? So the average, the mean mu, you'll see this a lot. Sigma, does anyone know what sigma stands for? Or what sigma represents? In uh, uh, statistics? Variance, yeah. standard, standard deviation. Yeah, standard deviation. So uh, sigma, sigma squared would actually be the variance, but Sigma itself would be the standard deviation. So you can see here, that's why I have mu and sigma here. Okay, so I'm saying an average of 14, a standard deviation of 2.8, and then I'm saying not n is 5,000 instances. And I can actually make this distribution by saying np.normal, we'll talk about what a normal curve is. I'll put mu, so that's my average, which is 14, sigma is 2.8, uh, n is 5,000. I'm just putting random numbers in here, it doesn't really matter. So now I have this distribution in here, and now I can actually, um, why did I show this? Okay, I don't know why I'm gonna copy this guy. Sorry, past Victor was doing some stuff. You can see here, it makes a bunch of random numbers here. And this is a histogram, right, of like that distribution. So you can see that some numbers, you know, if I were to go ahead and print out, like it's gonna be 5,000 numbers of this, but you can see this, it's gonna be 14.7, 16.151, one, whatnot, right? And you can see here, basically, that's what's going on here. They're binning it together like a histogram. And you can see I highlighted the average, which was 14. Um, and then we can see in green here, our standard deviation. So we can say, oh, there's one standard deviation to the left or one, like basically mu minus sigma, right? Is this value over here? And then mu plus one sigma over here. So if I now go ahead and just uh, redesign this, oops. Sorry, everyone. All right, so let's say I do a sig um, mu of let's say 20, right? Or I'll just say 14. And then let's do a different standard, standard deviation. So I do a standard deviation of like, let's say something much, much larger. Let's say like 12, okay? Same 5,000, right? I have a new distribution. If I plot this now, which you can see, this was the original one down here. I just made a copy. I'm gonna rerun this. And you can see here, it's gonna be a little bit different. So the spreads out and you can see from this axis here, even though the average is pretty close, right? You can see that there's gonna be some values that are much smaller and much higher, where this is much tighter. If I had my instead sigma much smaller, let's say something like 0.02, we're gonna see this get kind of uh, squeezed in. But you'll see that shape is still the same, like that general shape. But if you look carefully, you can see, oh, the values only go from 13.9 to about 14.075. So what's happening here is basically our spread of our values. They're more, when we have a smaller sigma, a smaller standard deviation in the normal curve, we expect the values to be really close to the mean. If we have a larger sigma, a lot larger standard deviation, we expect them to be much more spread out. Okay. So a lot of times you'll hear sigma talk about like being the spread. Okay. Sound pretty good. All right. Hopefully this sounds kind of like review too. Like maybe you guys have done this already in statistics. All right. So just kind of show you some um, data set right here. I have the California housing test. CSV, so this is a CSV with some information about you know, different aspects, the population, where the house is, median age, you know, median house um, value for that area. So I'm just gonna go ahead and take this, like, okay, I can make a distribution where I'm gonna say DF housing median age, right? So yeah, so housing median age is right here. So I'm gonna take that as the actual um, like distribution. So I'm gonna just look at basically all these different values that were in um, housing median age. And then mu, I'm just gonna say, all right, let me just go ahead and take the average 
of that actual value. So I can take a whole bunch of lists of numbers, right? Take the actual average, right? Say that as mu. Sigma is going to be standard deviation of that, you know, housing age, uh, median age. And I go and run this guy. And you can see here, I can see the average is 28.84 and then 12.5. Um, so just that's 28.8 years. So about 30 years old. And then a spread about 12. So I can actually um, also plot this out. And so just similar as me doing this part, though, I generated this one. This is real data. You can see here, I have the distribution of the actual house now. And you can see here is that like, oh yeah, here's the average, but you can see it's gonna be a little bit different. And I actually plotted a couple things here. So one is the actual histogram, right? And you can see this blue line here. This is something that we're going to do something called a KDE. So kernel density estimation plot. And basically this is trying to make a more organic kind of like look as if we filled in all those gaps and stuff, what would it tend to look like? Uh, we'll talk about how we develop this, but KDEs are really helpful because then we can say, hey, there's an actual equation we can actually design here and say, oh, that's the equation of this distribution. Okay, cool. So that's kind of just showing an example. All right. Um, and of course, as usual, stop me if you guys have questions or a comment that you want to throw in. So statistical distribution. So we're going to go through a few different versions of like what this is. So we're going to start with probability mass functions, and then we're going to go into um, cumulative distribution functions, or CDFs, and then uh, PDFs, which are probability density functions. Um, these two tend to be much more common than using the probability mass function, uh, mostly because the probability mass function we'll see is kind of like more discrete. And usually we think of things in terms of like more continuum and stuff like that, um, which is more of the PDF side. Okay. So let's start talking about uh, PMFs. So probability mass function, um, you can think of it like, why is it called mass function? You can kind of think of like masses hanging on a bar. So what this visually looks like, it looks kind of like this. Um, this is kind of like a stem leaf plot where basically you have essentially a bar sticking up that bell, right? Or like not bell, that little ball on the top right there is kind of like the mass. So you can have kind of imagine the mass being like concentrated at those exact points. Um, essentially it's a histogram. Right? But you'll notice that the histogram, it's not necessarily a histogram because a histogram will show how many, um, what's it called? How many times you know, in this range. For example, let's say you had like, this is 12 or whatever. This is counting, oh, there are like 20 instances. But you'll see on the left here, it's percentage. And what those percentages basically represent are the frequency. So instead of saying, oh, you had showed up 20 times you know, of a total of 100 times, that would essentially just be 20 divided by 100. So you know, what's that, 0.2. Right, so that would be kind of point two on like that list. Okay, so it kind of helps a little bit to see like a coding example. And I'm just showing you guys some code to basically like how you could simulate this stuff. So I'm just going to import something called collections, which is going to make it a little bit easier for me to count some stuff. Um, and I have Matplotlib, so I can plot some things as well. Okay, so I'm going to roll some dies, right? Because classically, for all statistics, we use dies and um, point flips. Um, but know that you can basically replace this with any kind of like distribution or any kind of like simulation. But we have a roll of die. We're going to roll it between one and seven. We're going to roll it 3,000 times. So we have 3,000 die rolls. One, well, not one through seven. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. It's not inclusive. And then I'm going to do the same thing with uh, die two, so which is identical, but it's going to be different roll dies or different die rolls. And then I'm actually going to do the sum of dice. So what's nice about NumPy arrays is that I create these NumPy arrays. These are each separately. I can just add them together. And that will add basically saying, oh, my first die rolls was like a one and let's say like a four. And I would add those together. Now my total die roll for that first one would be five. So that's what I'm doing here. So if I quickly print this out, you can see here, here's my first few die rolls. Four, two, five, 3,000 different ones. You get the end here. Same thing, three, six, three. And then you can see ends over here. And then I'm just adding them together for my sum of dies. So you can see here, four plus three, give me a seven, an eight, an eight, an eight, an eight, an eight seven. Okay. I know there's 3,000. Or, was it 3,000? Yeah, 3,000 of them. So it's like, okay, cool. Like, let's go ahead and try to plot this out to see, like, what's the most common die roll, right? So as you guys probably know, um, does any one number for a, a fair die actually show up more often than the other? Would you expect to roll a one more than a six? No, right? Yeah. You would expect it to be the same every single time, um, at least the probability of you rolling each one. So you would expect something that could, like a pretty frequent, like, like okay, you, like about the same number of ones as twos as threes and fours. Um, for the sum, would we expect the sum to be equally distributed? No. No, right? Yeah. So there's definitely going to be, for example, getting a two, which is only from snake eyes, one and one, is going to be less frequent than getting something like a six, which can be like three and three, four and two, five and one, right? So there's all these different ways. Um, can we get a 13? 
No. Yeah, right. Like there's no way to get a 13 from two dice. Um, I know sometimes I sound like really basic stuff, but that means the event space, right? Our probability space uh, for two dice being rolled, the sum of those two can only basically go from two, three, four, all the way up to 12. And that's it. You can never have one. You can never have um, 13. You can't have numbers in between. So it's kind of good to kind of do that quick check. So um, I'm just counting each. So um, basically this will show you a dictionary that basically will show you say, all right, for the number, um, for example, the sum of dice, it is going to be seven appears 532 times, eight appears 433 times, six appears 417 times. So this way I'm just counting how many times each roll happens. And note that um, it's possible, for example, like if I had like very, very few rolls, right? Let's say like three rolls, there's some of these will be blank, right? So you wouldn't maybe have like a seven or you wouldn't have like a 12 because you didn't roll enough times. Okay, cool. So got this guy right here. Just going to walk you guys through that counter. All right, and now we're going to go ahead and do a plot. So I'm going to make this plot range from one to 12, right? So remember that range is going to be ending at 12 since it's not inclusive. And what I'm doing right here is basically just rounding it off to get the frequency. So I'm basically, I'm saying, okay, how many, um, you know, counters for die one? I'm going to get K, right? So that's kind of like saying, get me, um, look for the die roll that is K. Um, so in this case, K being like either one, two, three, four, and then I actually go up to 12, but die rolls won't really matter. Um, so note that basically on here, if I had not done get K, another way we could have done this, just to kind of show you guys why this wouldn't work. If I did this guy, which would almost work, that's kind of like using a dictionary, right? We're getting that specific number. I'm using uh, K here. What happens if I get to um, K and I try to look for the number 10? in this single die roll. Anyone got, like, would it go fine? Would it go through fine? Would I get an error? Like, what kind of error would I get? I gotta guess. So yeah, so this is where it's kind of fun. Like, you know, I like to tell you guys, just kind of think about like what would happen and see what happens and just try it out, right? And you can see here, hey, it kind of went, went through. That's cool, right? So let me go and just see what happens if I do a PMF uh, die. Oops. You can see here, okay. And what's kind of nice is that it actually does pull up this fine. And that's because something to do with the default list encounter. But the safer thing to do, which is why you can see pass Victor being very careful, is you can do dot get, and this is a default value. So if K doesn't exist, it will default to zero because you never got a 12. So you should kind of count that as zero, okay? So I'll do that for each one. Everyone follow me on this, like what I was kind of showing? Okay, cool. And I'm getting just basically a percentage, so. If I do this now, for example, if I check out uh, PMF sum, you can see here basically this is representing I got one zero times, which makes sense. You know, uh, two zero point three times, 0 0.05 for two, um, or sorry, for three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 10, 11, 12. Nice little P PMF. So now we can actually plot this out. And I'm going to plot this out. And you can see here, I got my nice little plot. Not that I kind of give a different style, 538 style. And you can see here, this is a single die. And since I'm going from one through 12, you can see here that all this is blank. And you can see here, it's still like on this first die roll, I got a few more fours than sixes and stuff, but it's about equal, right? It's not too ridiculous, like out of the way. Um, if you did this many, many times, like hundreds of thousands of times, this, these numbers will get closer and closer to each other. At least we would expect it if it's a fair die. Okay. So now if I run this guy right here, like we expected, um, six and seven and eight are going to be a lot more common than like 12 and like in two, right, for two dice. So if I run this, we'll see kind of like a curve and you can see this guy right here. And I even show you a histogram of this. So note that the difference between this, um, like I say, like a stem plot, right? But um, basically from your PMF compared to a histogram, it's the same shape. In fact, if we just kind of like took this um, like step and just made it a dot, it'd be almost the same. It would be the same exact shape. However, what's going to happen is that we're counting how many times this happened versus the probability or the frequency of this occurring. Okay. Cool. Any questions at all for this PMF? All right. So just know the PMF basically relies on discrete values. So um, we'll see an extension of this with the PDF, but it's also nice to talk about something called the cumulative distribution function. So this is another way to describe information um, of events that happen. So a CDF basically um, is this fancy little function right here. F of X is equal to the probability of X, that's an event happening, 
um, is less than or equal to this x. So basically, it's counting everything that occurs. So I just wanted to show you this um, math equation. Do you have to memorize this math equation? Absolutely not, right? But basically, it's showing you how you can mathematically show this idea. So the idea here is that the function f of x, right, is going to say, okay, where should we, like, if I put the number in four, where should I put the dot on this y axis? And so what it's going to do is like, okay, you're going to say, what's the probability of getting not just a four, but also a three, a two, a one, everything less than that. So these probabilities would be added up together. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. And so um, this is where cumulative, uh, cumulative distribution. So cum sum, right? Cumulative, I'm butchering that word right now, summation, right? Basically, I'm summing up everything beforehand. So I'm adding up all the previous things, not just the one that I'm looking at. So it's going to count, for example, if I have four, it's going to count all the ones that I did, three, two, and one, um, and also four. So you can see here, I can actually plot this out, and I'm doing a step function. And you can see here, we see this kind of like ladder. And what's going on here is that basically it's like, okay, we have about, you know, for, uh, this is one die roll, we have about 0.3, right, for one die roll. Um, or for one die roll, we get 0.3 of the time, the number one. And then if we have, um, look at two, we get about um, 0.5 for getting either a one or a two. And then you can see here, we go up this point right here, we have about a 0.75 chance, yeah, 0.7, 0 0.7% chance, or 0 0.7, yeah, 70% chance, right, of getting um, a one, two, three, or, um, yeah, one, two, or three, okay? And that makes sense, right? He's like, okay, we're starting to get higher and higher. Um, I think, actually, I'm looking at this wrong, to be honest. Oh, no, maybe I'm wrong. Sorry, I'm trying to do the numbers. Oh, I, I am looking at the wrong step, see? I should be looking at this bottom step here, bottom step, bottom step. So that three should be about 0.5, which that actually makes a lot of sense, right? You're half the time gonna get a one, two, or three because the other half the time you're not gonna, you're gonna get a four, five, six. And you can see here, added this up. And you can see here basically all uh, CDFs will go up to one, right? Because you cover the whole event space, right? So you can kind of see this general trend. So if everything is equal, um, would my steps, like each time I go up here, what should they get smaller? Like should they get smaller and smaller as I increase upwards? Should they get bigger or should they stay the same? If it's like equal probability of getting the same um, like value. Okay, I guess. I think I saw Vera say something. I thought I said same. Right yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so they, they would be the same because you would in, you would only increase the same amount every single time, right? The probability doesn't change. So this is kind of showing like, okay, we're thinking of the whole thing, uh, um, like all the different things up below this. So each time we go on to the next step, step, it's the same probability. So we're only going to go up by the same amount every single time. If the probability changed based on, you know, what value it is, we would see those steps, you know, either increase or decrease. And so you can actually see this, for example, if I do this for PMF, um, what was the, what was it called? Sum. If I do sum, we won't see this equal um, step up and up and up. We'll actually see it kind of change. You can see here, it's very small probability for us getting a one, or well, there's no probability of getting a one, but like a two, and then a three, and then a four. And you can see that it's a higher probability of getting a six and like a seven, for example. And you can see that step going up and up and up. In fact, if we were to have many, many choices, which we'll see an example in a second, um, you would actually see this graph right here look closer and closer to like, kind of like this S curve. So if I were to kind of draw it over here, is that if we had like many, many choices, let's say you have like a thousand sided die, right? And you rolled a die over and over and over and over again. And we had like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, all the way to a thousand over here. This CDF is going to look like a straight line because basically it's just gonna go up the same amount every single time, right? So we're just kind of going up in a straight line. But if we rolled something like, I don't know, uh, two 1,000 sided dies, right? So we can have basically up from two to 2,000, right? What this is gonna look like is that at the small end right here, it's very unlikely for us to get a very small value. We're likely to get like the average value, like you know, like we saw this big spike right here. So what we'll see is like very, it's not gonna increase very much and then it's gonna increase a lot. I'm gonna go like this. So you're gonna see this kind of like this S shape right here where essentially there's very um, 
the step, the increase is very, very small, and then it's going to get very, very big, and then go very, very small again because we're unlikely to get these values on this end of the the whole continuum. Okay. Does that make sense to people? Right. Cool. Any questions at all? Okay, I tried to kind of show you guys how this would kind of relate with each other. So. Um, as you get more and more values in this stuff like this, you'll see CDFs look like this or straight line. That tells you basically that distribution. All right. So let's go on to the big one, probability density functions, PDFs. So this is probably when you're going to use the most. CDFs are used quite a lot too, but probability density functions are probably the first thing you're going to go to when you're trying to um, look at um, a distribution of um, like events. So they're just like PMFs, but they're continuous. So you can see here, I found this one online, is basically someone put, um, I don't even know what this is about, to be quite honest, but you can see basically it's like a histogram right here. And of course it's not a histogram, it's actually a uh, PMF because we're seeing the frequency on the side here. Note that people will still call this histograms, even though technically it's not a histogram, it technically is a PMF graph, but everyone just calls it a histogram anyway. So you can see here the distribution right here, and this PDF right here is basically showing this continuous value. Note that these aren't quite exactly right, um, like you can see there's a spike right here, but the idea here is that you have a dis um, continuous distribution. So in here you can see 0 to 400, they're kind of been together, but maybe you're like, what if I get 375? You know, what's the frequency of me expecting 375? It's like, oh, it's a, you know, 0.2% chance or something like that. Okay, so you can kind of see this continuation or like how these relate together. So one thing to note about this is that in order to know any probability at all, we need to actually use a range. So we can never find an exact number. And so a good example of this is kind of saying, what is the probability, like if I were to say like this is a big old circle right here, and I say, okay, what's the probability of me, I'm trying to pick something that's a little easy to see. If I just say, okay, I cut this target in half, and let's pretend that at least everyone will land on the target, not like randomly, like off the board. And we just throw it randomly on here, right? What's the probability of me hitting this side of the target? Assuming I drew this nice straight line in half. Five. Five. Uh, sorry, <laughs> like percent. Um, oh, 50%, 0.5. Yeah, 0 0.5 or 50%, sorry. <laughs> um, maybe that was word, worded well, uh, not well. But yeah, 50%, right? Half of the time I would land on half of the target. Pretty straightforward, right? If I did something similar, if I said, hey, what if I cut this in a quarter, right? You would say, oh, well, one out of the four times you would land in here randomly, right? 25%, right? Pretty straightforward, right? I think most people intuitively know this or have at least learned this enough in stats class and grade school and all that stuff. So let me ask you guys, what's the probability of me landing right here? Anyone got a guess? Hmm. 30%? What's that, 30%? So like this exact, like I should say, maybe I should make it a little better. Like if instead of having that little X, a single dot, landing oh. on that exact dot, what's the probability of me landing on that exact dot? Very small. <laughs> very small. Yes, I, you're good. Um, <laughs> you're very small indeed. Um, anyone got a guess how small? Um, I can't guess exactly how small, but I would assume the formula for it would be one out of whatever. I mean, assuming the dot's like a millimeter wide, you would do one over the width. Like you would figure out the area and then do that. The area yeah. of the I'm, I'm going to go really mathematical on everyone. What if okay. I'm infinitely, like infinitesimally small? So like physics okay. loves infinitesimal. Um, and like, it's like, oh, instead of one millimeter, it's like, well, we can get smaller than that and smaller than that and smaller than that. And that's when you start saying, well, how many points are there? You, you got the right idea, Cameron, for sure. Um, which so is it's one at. over the limit as X approaches a million, infinite, infinity. Yeah, basically yeah. that. Um, so if you guys know calculus, right, the limit of X approaches infinity. So that's like the number of points that are on here. So we get these small points really, really small, right? Um, over x, well, I should say like my point, right? How many points I'm looking at. And basically this ends up going to infinity, which ends up being the probability of zero. There's a zero percent chance of getting that exact single point. So very, very small indeed. Um, and the reasoning for this is kind of saying like, I like physically, like what does that mean? Because that seems kind of weird. Is that it's like if I threw a dart and saying, okay, I have a little hole there. It's like, all right, can you throw a dart exactly on that hole? And like you land something like really, really close. You're like, oh, that's that's it. And you zoom in, you're like, oh no, it wasn't exact. It was slightly off. And you could always zoom in further and further and further and further in. So 
to the point basically where measurement doesn't have any meaning. But the point is basically any single point is going to be a 0% probability. Um, so we always have to look at a range. So kind of what Cameron was saying is that if you took like a, a circle, like, oh, we could figure out what proportion of that, you know, area could be done. So like, what's the probability of landing in this, you know, target area? And I think that's closer to what Nyla would maybe was um, thinking when I said, when I put the little X here, saying, oh, we're landing in this like target area. It's like maybe a 30% chance because 30% of the area. But the important part is to know is that for a continuum is that we can never say an exact point. We can only say a range because basically an exact point will always be 0%. But we can say, well, what about within this area? And that would be how we get our probability. Does that make sense to people? Wanted to put that little subtlety on, like get that little nuance in there because I think it is important. Um, so one thing we'll always do, sorry, I'm kind of going really quickly and kind of jumping around a little bit, but we will want to normalize this area to one. So we always want to normalize the total area that we can possibly land into. So we could say, oh, this is like, you know, let's say 50 square meters or something like that. Um, we always want to define this area into a smaller, like into just the number one. And the reason why, as you can probably guess, is that, that we can always talk about percent. So we know the area underneath there is always going to be a percentage, right? It's going to be, um, there's only a probability of what, like 100% you will land in the event space, right? So we always normalize that to one. And that way it makes it easier for us to figure out uh, this probability underneath this curve is, for example, like, oh, like everything underneath this curve will be a probability of one, 100%. And then if you want a portion of this, it's going to be certain percentage of that area. And that area, like, for example, it's like, oh, point, you know, 13, right? Well, that's going to be 13% then. Okay. So no, that's why we always normalize suffer to one. And we'll see this again, especially in um, like, like we're actually doing this like in Bayes rule, which we'll talk about, I believe maybe next week or the week after. Um, we actually, when we use Bayes rule, we're actually normalizing over and over and over again to make sure we always get down to um, start with a 100%. So that way we can always go from there. All right. Um, so last thing I want to kind of put out before we kind of move on to the next part is some PMF, CDF. I found this great uh, diagram right here. It's, it's close enough. It's not quite. But basically you have um, this uh, actual like PMF, which is kind of like the histogram looking thing. You have the PDF, which is this black line. And then you can see the CDF here, right? And so these are all three plotted on top of each other. So you can kind of see how they can all like um, basically represent the same information, but um, can basically, they look different from each other. Okay, and they all have our different uses. Um, who kind of give me a thumbs up? Who looked at the video that I sent out about um, COVID-19 and those three blue, one brown? Um, I see a thumbs up in there from Ryan, a few of them from there. Yeah, so you'll notice that basically they talk about essentially doing um, a distribution, exponential distribution versus essentially a CDF. Um, we're basically a cumulative distribution function where you count the total number of cases versus the new cases every single time. So that's how kind of how we can use different ways of representing the same stuff. It's not quite exactly what we're showing here, but if you can kind of see that if you're if you're familiar with this kind of diagram, you're like, oh, I can see what this is representing. Um, so anyway, cool. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Visualizing a PDF. Just remember that all the data is discrete, but PDF is continuous. So. If you're thinking of a PMF versus a PDF, it's always going to be a PDF is going to be that density, meaning that like there's a continuum. So you can be any value along that whole like, you know, X axis. Okay. Sound pretty good? Cool. All right. I thought I'm going to do a lot of information today and we're not going to even get through all of it because um, this is a big section. So normal distribution, like I will tell you, it's, it's probably like arguably one of the most important distributions that you will ever, ever learn in statistics. Um, and basically note that this is called normal distribution, bell curve, Gaussian, they all are basically the same, like they're referring to the same shape. Um, so one thing about normal distributions, like why we love them so much is basically because they have beautiful math. And I'm not joking about that. It's like the reason why we have Gaussian distributions and like how awesome they are is because we can actually describe them really easily with mathematics, which you might say, what like this does not look like it. this is actually describing the Gaussian distribution normal curve and you look at that and you're like Victor that looks awful like, what are you talking about and the reason why I'm saying this is like hey it's not as bad as you think so we know pretty much all of these parts so we have y and x so we're familiar with yx y being like the actual value x being something along this x-axis um, then we also have some numbers here the square root of like oh my gosh but it's not that bad because it's like oh it's a square root of two pi well those are just a number it's just some kind of number essentially, to actually make it so it's a value of one. Um, we also have this two, two's aren't scary. And then we have this E, which is probably the scariest looking thing in here right now, at least in my opinion. 
and that e is basically the exponential. So some number raised to the power. So it's an exponential growth. And notice it's negative here. So it's got some funkiness into it. But once you kind of, you know, kind of squint your eyes a little bit, kind of ignore that funkiness, you can see there's only like really two main things that really affect this whole curve and like what the shape looks like. And that's sigma, the standard deviation, and mu, the mean. So basically what this means, if we say, hey, if this distribution of whatever we're looking at, if we expect it to follow a normal curve, a bell curve, a Gaussian, whatever you want to call it, you, all you need to know is the mean and the standard deviation, and boom, you know immediately what the full distribution is. And that's really, really powerful when you think about that, because that means we can possibly measure something knowing like, okay, we expect this to be a normal distribution. Um, and then we take the measurements, enough measurements to say, hey, we can confidently say we think the average will be, you know, 28 years for the median house price or whatever it is you're looking at. And we know the standard, devi standard deviation. We can then determine the whole probability of finding things that we've never seen before. And that's actually going to be the root of hy um, hypothesis testing. So the Gaussian distribution normal curve is actually a really powerful tool that we have. And what's really cool, which we'll learn about next week, is the central limit theorem in section uh, 13. Um, the central limit theorem basically guarantees us, like, hey, you can get a normal distribution um, with any values or any um, thing. So we can actually use the normal distribution since we know it'll always be a normal distribution, um, at least according to central limit theorem, um, and actually determine, say, hey, if we do this enough times, we can actually always get a normal distribution, which is like, sweet. Now we can use a powerful math. And what's cool is that um, since, you know, this is a little scary, it's not that scary, it's kind of, it's a cute little function. Um, but you can use the mathematics, we know the mathematics automatically, so you can actually say a lot of quick things. So this is where the 68, 95, 99 rule. Anyone heard about this rule? Yeah, maybe. Sounds, maybe back in like you know, stats class back in high school or something like that, you might have heard something like this. So it's a really nice rule. Basically, it comes down to the fact that, hey, if we have a normal distribution, and remember the probability is just the area underneath the curve, we can just look at this normal distribution here and say, if we're one standard deviation away from the mean, right? So minus one standard deviation, plus one standard deviation, we will have 68% of all values within one standard deviation of, it, um, of this, like of the mean. Does that make sense? So if I have the mean here, I can go one standard deviation below, one standard deviation above, and within that kind of range, we're gonna get 68% of all the values. If I go two standard deviations from here basically to here, I will get about 95% of all the different values um, uh, in that possible thing. And then if I go three standard deviations, it's still not going to include everything because there's going to be some really weirdos that are going to be way off to the side. But if I go three standard deviations to the left, three standard deviations to the right, I'll get about 99% or, you know, here you can see 99.7. But at that point, it's like 99% of like, all values. And if, technically, if I go further and further out, I'll get closer and closer to 100%, but never the full 100% because there can always be some weird instance that we accidentally did it. Think of it like if you flip coins, if you magically were eight, like not magically, but like if you had enough people flip a coin enough times, um, eventually, eventually, um, you would get someone who could flip a coin, like you would have someone who flips a coin a thousand times in all heads. Like it doesn't mean the coin's unfair, it's just like just pure randomness, right? Um, that's really, really rare. And that'd be like many standard deviations off the side here. Um, so some kind of quick fun facts of like what this means. Um, if you, let's see here. So, um, when we start talking about like statistical testing and stuff like this, we'll talk about being so many standard deviations off to the side or, you know, we'll use something like alpha um, as basically our p-value. And basically this is describing saying how many standard deviations are we away from this average or the expected outcome, right, this mu. And for medical science in general, like I'm obviously I'm not a biologist, so I can't say specifically, um, but in general, if you're three standard deviations away from the expected result, you would say, hey, like, I don't expect to be out here and I'm over here. Like that is super rare for it to happen. Like you can see here 0.3% of the time that would consider like being an effective drug. So for example, if you get people, um, you know, some new medicine and a placebo and you find the people who have the medicine are three standard deviations away from the people with the placebo, right? So that's the average right there. You would say, wow, that drug is actually like must be effective, right? So that's kind of how we kind of determine like, you know, is this new medicine actually useful or this study significant or, what we we'll call about statistically significant. Um, fun fact is all, many areas of science, basically all areas of science have the same exact thing. So in physics, uh, you also have this kind of thing where you talk about how many standard deviations are you away from the mean. Um, 
And there's certain levels where you can say, well, there's suggestion of maybe there's a new, you know, some new interesting science. And then there's also like saying, oh, this is actually clear evidence of a new discovery. Um, has anyone got a guess for how many standard deviations you need to say for a new discovery? Like for example, when they talk about the Higgs boson, they said there's either a case of not having the Higgs boson or the, actually the Higgs boson does exist. How many standard deviations they have to be away from um, that part? Anyone got a guess? This, I saw uh, Stephen do a quick number. I couldn't see it though at the time. Two, two standard deviations, right? So like a little less, like a little less than like medical science. Like medical science, like, oh, we need to make sure drugs don't like kill people, right? It's like three standard deviations. I'm thinking that's kind of like reasoning, right? Two standard, standard deviations, a little bit less than that. Yeah, turns out it's a little bit more than that. Um, turns out it's seven standard deviations um, needed for you to determine if they're like, in the science community at least, um, and for especially par particle physics to say, oh yes, we definitely see a real thing. So I like to tell people, like, especially when I was in physics, it's like, hey, like you, like in physics, we have to be more certain than like the drug that we're giving, like doctors are giving you to make sure it doesn't kill you. Like that's kind of the certainty that you have like in certain sciences. And this is where, like I will tell you is that um, we'll talk about p-values in the near future. Um, p-values are all relative. It depends on like what level are you willing to accept. And a lot of it comes down like, for example, for medicine is that there's so many little factors that can affect medicine and what happens. So um, we're okay with saying, well, there's going to be some variation in this case. And that's why we have to accept three standard deviations. If you waited for seven standard deviations to do any medicine, basically we would not have modern medicine. There'd be nothing we could actually like confidently give if we said seven standard deviations is like what we need to have. Um, for physicists, the opposite is that we do so many experiments over and over and over again is that if we were to accept three standard deviations or lower, it actually would be pretty like difficult to say like when we were like we would see conflicting um, results all the time and that's why for example they have a really high value on that side um, so anyway kind of good to know um, cool so let's see here oh good we have about 12 minutes about where I thought we'd be um, so z-score I'm gonna kind of very quickly skip over this it's in the curriculum but I'm not gonna touch it right now because we're gonna talk about hypothesis testing um, in I think section 14 um, and we'll talk about that z-score because we'll talk about something called a t-score or a t-test. Um, but basically just know that your z-score, all it is is really code for is saying how many standard deviations are you away from the mean. So if your z-score is 1.2, it means that you are 1.2 standard deviations from the expected mean. Okay, so I'm just going to kind of say that real quickly. Um, I honestly forgot what this is right here. So I'm just going to open this up real quick. Oh yes, so okay, this is a fun one. This is, you can actually um, adjust, everything is fun. But uh, you can actually, I'm gonna move my mean right here. I can adjust this st uh, standard deviation and you can see here basically the distribution of those points. If, for example, if uh, the standard deviation is zero, you can see the standard, or sorry, the mean is zero, it's centered at zero. We call it like being centered. If I change it over to something like about four, you would see basically the average is standard, the distribution is centered at four and the standard deviation, if I decrease the standard deviation, there's more and more chances of you being in this smaller area, right? Uh, if I make it a very large standard deviation, you can see basically it's really, really spread out here. And you can see if I actually show z-score, you'll see that basically saying, okay, let's say I have this value here, this value over here. You can say, okay, I'm this many standard deviations away from the mean. So you can see here it's like we're 2.98, but we're actually about this number away from the mean, so you can see one. So negative 0.36. If I increase this, you can see that's going to be about one standard deviation. There you go. Okay, so kind of a fun little interactive thing you can have. Yeah, just go ahead. So this is like what our collective efforts are trying to do with COVID, right? Flatten the curve of mm, cases not, over not, time. Not the, not, the same, uh, not the same exact thing, but it's in fact, mm, it's more like uh, the CDF. Like if you remember the CDF that we have, we are trying to push that part down so there's less cases. That's eh, not even that. It's the same it's not, amount of cases though, right? Yeah, I will say it's like- Over time. Really, yeah, you probably have seen something like, <laughs> like that. This graph is not the same thing as what we're talking about in that graph for COVID. If you guys have seen like the flatten the curve, hopefully that's kind of making the rounds for people. Um, it looks very similar. Frequency of cases, no? Yeah, it's not Over quite time. the same thing. It's okay. much more like, um, yeah, it's, this is more like the total number of cases at any given time. So quick, quick sidestep just because of uh, COVID <laughs> and it's relevant is that if you guys have seen that 
graph, right? You, there's usually something like this big sp uh, spike right here, and then there's something like that looks like this. You guys see something like this, and then usually there's a little line like this, right? And they say flatten the curve where we want to basically, oh, we want to make this flat. What this axis is supposed to represent is time. And this is just the number of cases, like number infected. So number of infected, just put in. And so the idea here is that when, if at this point in time, let's say this is like week two of initial infection or something like that. If we have too many people infected, the healthcare system, which is this red line here, can't handle this additional extra people. So the idea here is when they say flatten the curve, it's like, well, okay, you, instead of having at the peak, you only have a number of like, let's say a hundred infections, you know, which the healthcare system can't handle at that single day or single week. Um, it looks very similar to this. So you can kind of see some similarities, but it definitely is not related, um, unfortunately. But good seeing, seeing shapes that look, <laughs> look similar. Anyway, cool. Um, cool. So anyway, I just have this little um, link to uh, Gaussian to kind of play around with it, get a feel for like how this changes. Um, so one quick thing is about some deviations from normal distribution. So this is where we talk about skewness and kurtosis. So this is kind of like, this is the normal curve, the normal, normal curve. And then we have something called skewness. So you can see this little quick diagram is that we talk about positive skewed or right skewed or left skewed. Basically the skew is the thing that's dragging out that tail. So you can see here, this is the normal symmetrical distribution. And this is positively skewed or right skewed where essentially that tail right here, if you imagine like if I grabbed, you know, this like part of the tail and dragged it off to the right or off to the positive direction, it would be positively skewed. So just know that's kind of the terminology. This is the skewness. And what you'll see here is that if you have a normal distribution, the mean and median will be actually centered right here. But if you have um, something that's skewed, so think of like skewed as like outliers. So you have some really high, you know, values, some really old homes, for example, like for our really initial example, it means that it's gonna bring out this average closer to that skewness. So it's gonna bring this, uh, average this mean off to the right. And that's why the median here though doesn't get moved as much from that initial point. And that's why we talk about saying the median is actually more robust from outliers. And basically outliers don't affect as much. It doesn't get affected as much as that skew. Okay. And you can see the opposite here if it's skewed negatively or ne to the left. Okay. Does that make sense to people? Cool. Um, there are some ways to metrically like name skewness, but again, it just all depends on what you're looking at. Um, Similar to this is something called kurtosis. So kurtosis is, oops, um, I think the curriculum actually goes in some detail about like kurtosis, like what this is. But the main thing you have to know about kurtosis is that essentially it's measuring instead of the spread. So you can imagine like this has got like a standard deviation and this has got a smaller standard deviation, right? So there's different distributions. You can have to do that different standard deviation. Um, kurtosis is kind of like the variation of the variation. So what that means is that something with a high, or let's say just a normal curve like this. This is my normal curve. Not a great normal curve, but it's a normal curve. And then I have something with high kurtosis. High kurtosis will still have the same standard deviation or could have the same standard deviation, but you'll see it spike up a lot more. And so this kurtosis is actually um, kind of interesting how you can calculate this. Um, variance is calculated, like, do you guys know how to, Let's see here. Okay, so mean, right? Average is the sum, right, of um, basically all the different values, let's call them x, divided by n, right? That's our mean. Our standard deviation squared, also called variance, is equal to the sum of all values x minus the average. So you figure out the average first, x minus the average squared, divided by n. Okay. Makes, makes, makes sense. Like that's kind of like, it's like, okay, we're seeing like what, how different it is from the mean. Kurtosis is, can be calculated as the sum of x minus um, mu cubed over n. And so what this is basically saying, it's measuring the spread of the spread, essentially. There's different ways to calculate kurtosis, but this is kind of one, you know, way you can kind of do it. And so that's why we have like this kind of like extra degree. I will tell you is that um, if you talk about kurtosis, it's because you're talking to a statistician, probably. Um, it's not usually something that comes in normal conversation. Um, it's harder to kind of like quantify exactly. Um, and then people say, what's a good, people always tell me, what's a good kurtosis? And I'm like, 
you know, we can say some numbers and stuff like this, but it's not really like a great way to like go off of it. It's better to understand like, why is there high kurtosis? Why is there more of a peak over there? And it could be just because there's lower variation and stuff. Um, but um, it's something I think that's, could something mm -hmm. that sounds like a disease ever be good? It does, it does sound like kurtosis. It does sound like a disease, right? Uh, you don't want to scare people too much. Um, actually, there's this little great uh, diagram. Um, Dreaming of thin tails, try the kurto kurto diet. Uh, so kurtosis. Um, but uh, you can see here, basically, the main idea is that you have what we call like um, heavy tails and stuff like this, where essentially your tails get flattened up. And that's basically kurtosis. Basically, you have less values you, than you would expect in the extreme part and you tend to be more focused in the middle. So if something with high kurtosis tends to be a little more, you know, um, I don't know, skinnier on the side and stuff like this. So I thought it was kind of a cute little picture that someone come up with. So anyway, that is a lot of distribution and that's just the normal distribution um, and all that stuff. But yeah, yeah, go ahead. What's the um, function of the measure using the measurement of kurtosis? It varies depending who you ask on how you want to measure this. So I think, the short answer to this is that um, you'd want to look at different ways, to, just like correlation. Like we talked about using Pearson's correlation, there's other ways to measure correlation. Same thing with kurtosis. It's basically there's other ways to measure kurtosis. I think the curriculum actually goes in some detail. Uh, for those people who've maybe come across this, maybe you guys remember it. Um, there's ways to calculate it. And honestly, I don't even like talking about it too much because in general, it's not necessary for a lot of things. This is where like maybe statisticians come at me, you know, like people like argue like, oh no, you need to know this. And I'm like, yeah, I don't know. Um, in general, it's not something I necessarily report and go off of by itself. Okay, cool. I'm a pragmatist like that. Maybe not the best one, but I don't know. Um, but it's good to know, at least know that like terminology and know where this can happen. And there are situations in, stat in statistics and stuff why you might want to talk about kurtosis and things. and. I don't know. In my opinion, it's not something that's usually talked about in like actual determining something. Um, it's kind of like, it's like if you take um, calculus, if you took like the fourth derivative of something, it's like technically that exists, but like, is it really that relevant? Like the acceleration of the acceleration of the acceleration, like that doesn't really make much sense to me. Um, this is where I, I'm from physics, where I'm like, certain equations do exist, but it's like, that would never really physically matter in that some ways. I won't go on any more tangents on that one. Um, but anyway, um, cool. So we're about time, but I just wanted to share a couple things. We'll talk about this actually um, next time because next week is going to be central limit theorem, but that's actually a much shorter section. Um, but I just wanted to mention about other statistical distributions. So in the curriculum, they talked about um, normal curves, which we talked about binomial distribution. And then um, they also talk about Bernoulli distribution, which is really just a special case of binomial. Um, but just kind of quickly show you what we're going to talk about a little bit um, and just some different values. There's also in the appendix more statistical distributions, um, which includes uniform. I actually don't know how much is in the appendix, but these are other distributions that can be useful. Negative binomial distribution, which sounds really intimidating. It's actually not that bad. Um, geometric distribution, Poisson distribution, which I will say is one of the more important ones, especially in data science, where you're talking about, you know, um, for example, how many customers will come in, you know, during, throughout the next month, the next week, the next day. Um, this can be really important. And then exponential distribution, which we're seeing right now in COVID and everything. So um, silver lining about talking about that. Um, but you can see here, this is like the negative binomial, which is just kind of like the discrete version of Poisson distribution, um, which we'll talk about maybe next time. And then exponential distribution. We talked about an exponential decay and exponential growth and all these really fun stuff that are definitely really relevant today. All right. Um, but that will be for next time. So I'll end it here. Um, be safe, everyone. <laughs> you know, have a great, uh, I guess we don't have anything planned for Friday. No, there is a guest speaker on Friday, tomorrow. Um, I put that out on the calendar too. So if you can make it, really great. It's um, a Nike software engineer. Um, so it's more of the software engineering aspect, but I think it could still be very relevant to um, data science. All right, everyone. Well, take care, uh, stay safe, and I will see you all around.